Hello, um, my name is Kreevin Maksiemasi uh, and I'm going to give, give you a, a short history of the USSR. This will be in four parts that we're dealing with the first part um, today, which is, which is to do with the Russian Revolution, the period, which obviously starts the whole USSR going. Um, the first picture there you can see in front of you is, is of the Russian Empire. Uh, the Russian Empire at, at, its, at, its, at its height before it became the USSR. And uh, on, on a geographical scale, it obviously looks very vast and very over, overpowering, but uh, one must realize that in, in the great game of the imperial powers, of um, that were uh, e European powers, the, the the this does not reflect their actual actual economic um, or political power. Uh, the Russian Empire, uh, although it was geographically vast, but the vast majority of the population is concentrated in the west of the country. Um, where you can see St. Petersburg and Moscow marked out. It's in that rough area, um, spreading as far as the Urals in one direction, as far as the German and Austrian borders in the other way. Um, but there are vast tracts of the country which are virtually unpopulated. Uh, in terms of technology and in terms of, uh, of, of advanced, um, uh, advanced means of production and um, the Russian empire is way, lagging way behind everybody else in Europe, uh, even Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman, the Ottoman empire possibly is even, is even, um, even more advanced than the Russian empire. Um, arguably, the Britain Britain leads off with the what's known as the cap, what might be called the capitalist revolution. The capitalist revolution uh, starts in 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 England in the sixteenth to seventeenth centuries, and um, it, and Britain uh, as it develops from the from the Kingdom of England into into the British Isles, the uh, it gets a head start of everybody else. Uh, it becomes a maritime power. It's not really that interested in, in maintaining its monopoly um, in, 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 in Europe. It's much more interested in, in trade and, and in, in, in acquiring capital through, through other means such as the slave trade, which is um, a, a form of primitive accumulation of capital. Um, they, however, um, and, and France is, um, is left way behind it, and uh, Germany is, a, is just a bunch of principalities, feudal, semi-feudal principalities, right up until the middle of the, um, of the, of the 19th century. France, France gets out of, um, of its, its, its backward state in the, roughly about the, early, the start of the 19th century, but it doesn't really pick up until the late 19th century again. And, and Germany just catapults itself forward very fast. By the end of the, of the 19th century, Germany is, is a rival with, with Britain. For that reason, Britain and France start to, to, um, to, to repair their, their enmity and, uh, and um, they eventually bring in the Russian Empire as well. And, and, and Russia starts very late on to, to develop uh, in, in, in the serfs are not uh, set free from their serfdom until until 1861, and uh, so in many ways Russia, despite its its the vast 
size of the territory that you can see there it is it is it, that doesn't really reflect its its its, its power in the world on the world stage uh, the, you can't see them on this map but uh, France Britain uh, even uh, Germany and even Italy have already started to to expand um, and become colonial colonial powers Britain's way ahead of everybody else of course um, but the others are catching up okay uh, next slide Okay, so we're now dealing with the, uh, the vast inequalities of wealth and poverty that existed in Russia uh, around about the period 1900-1905. So the uh, Russian Empire in the early 20th century is a place of extremes. So you have ancient wealth and privilege associated with the aristocracy uh, which is living cheek by jowl with a, a squalor and a deprivation, which you can see on the right, uh, which is um, poor peasants in who uh, make up a, quite a large proportion of, of the population. Um, there is a small middle middle class in the in the Western sense, but this is um, very weak. And it's also very dependent on foreign capital, particularly from Brit from its allies, Britain and France. Uh, they, the, um, the, as I say, there there is a middle class, but uh, the the aristocracy, um, although they are no longer getting the majority of their revenue from their estates, um, they have found alternative means to uh, to um, expand their 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 re re revenue by getting state state jobs so they they have they have um, they have acquired a virtual monopoly over the civil civil service and over the um, officer officer class in the in the army and the navy and um, and at the very top of the pyramid is the Tsar, who is still is is is, is still an autocrat. Um, he is he is um, he is uh, uh, he, he is a a um, autocratic monarch in the manner of say Louis Louis the Sixteenth, um, more or less. Um, there is a Duma or Parliament to keep him in check, but um, or supposedly keep him in check, but it actually has very limited, limited, limited powers. So he, he's almost as as powerful as say James the First of England or Louis the Sixteenth of, of France. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Louis the Fourteenth of France. Um, and um, he's he's the that he is also God's anointed representative on earth in the in the in the view of the of the of the dominant ideology. Next slide. Right. Um, there is, however, resistance to to this. Uh, it goes all the way back, of course, to the Decemberists uh, in the eighteen. 1820s and through the Narodniks of the of the later uh, um, uh, um, 19th century, but um, but this what we're going to be dealing with. What I'm just going to give you a brief outline of is the formation formation of of actual political parties that are in in um, underground political parties that that are uh, in opposition to the to the to the existing order and are are uh, influenced by socialism um, so you have basically two two different groups that arrive at arise out of the 19th century and on one on one level you have the um, the Social Democratic Party of 
of the uh, Russian Empire, and uh, which is very linked to what's going on in, in Germany. We'll be talking about this shortly. Uh, but the but there's also the the Socialist Revolutionary Party, uh, and the Socialist Revolutionary Party is more is more based on the on the peasantry. The the um, Social Democratic Party is by and large, except in Georgia and, and a couple of other places, is by and by and large very very uh, focused on the cities. So it has it has um, it has a, a following amongst the uh, the the intelligentsia in the cities. Um, this is where they get most of their leaders from. But they, but there are um, also workers involved in the um, in the in the Social Democratic Party. Uh, the Socialist Revolutionary Party is more based around the peasantry. Uh, the Social Democratic Party uh, is more; they derive most of their theory from Marx. Uh, the Socialist Revolutionary Party, however, on the other hand, they 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 read a bit. They, they certainly read Marx, but they also, but they're also interested in in other other theories as well. So they would be also taking on board ideas from Bakunin and Kropotkin. Um, so we can move on to the next next picture. Okay, so so we have um, the, the the figure on the on the left there is um, is Stolipin. Uh, he actually comes from um, his main period of power is after the uh, Russia-Japanese War and the and the nineteen oh five revolution, which we'll be talking about in in. In a minute, but he he and his predecessors are basically they are ministers of the Tsar, and they're trying to keep the Tsar um, in 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 the Tsarist monarchy in in operation. But to do so, they 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 want to 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 bring in industrialization, um, and they and they want to change change the the um, the the mode of production to a capitalist um, a, a more overtly capitalist one. So Stolipin is is the is the main one who tries to to uh, take the land from from the peasant peasant communes. Um, he 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 tries to do that. And he he pays for his life for it in the end. Uh, in 1911, he's assassinated. But um, but uh, what he's 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 trying to do is he he's trying to to uh, bring in this idea of improving the land, which um, which is what the the um, English nobles would try to do in the in the 16th um, 17th 17th century and succeeded and what he's trying to do is play catch up um, with uh, this about 200 200 years later um, with with what they had managed to do back then um, of course the peasantry do not like this because uh, the if the, the land is privatized then they are going to be uh, denied their their means of of subsistence and reproduction and uh and uh, as i say again in the in the cities um because this process has, has started uh the the unemployed uh peasants who have had their land privatized they end up having to work in these factories as you can see on the right Next slide. Okay, so this is the uh, 1889 uh, meeting of the um, of the International Working Men's Association uh, in Stuttgart uh, in Germany. 
and uh, the, there are this is this is where the social democratic wing of the International Working Men's Association uh, starts to really take hold. Uh, this is uh, Frederick Engels is still alive. Marx is, has already passed on his way, but uh, Frederick Engels is is still is still going at this stage, and and the um, and they are starting to develop a particular form of or a particular theory uh, that's supposed to be derived from Marx, from the teachings of Marx. Um, that's debatable in, towards the end of his life. Marx had a conversation with his daughter. He said, je ne suis pas marxiste, I am not a Marxist. I may be called Marx, but I'm not a Marxist. Um, meaning that he was, he was rather alarmed at the, at the crudification of his theories, which was being, which was being bandied around as being Marxism. And um, unfortunately, this takes root very strongly at the 1889 um, conference. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, these, and these people here um, are, are the, they, all, they all pledge some sort of allegiance to the to the whole concept of the of this of the stages theory. Now, the stages theory, to put it crudely, is um, is this idea that um, that societies all go through a, a series of stages. So they so they go through first feudalism, and then they go through a capitalist mode of production. And then they um, then they enter socialism. How they enter socialism is debatable. They may enter it through a revolutionary process where the workers uh, seize product, seize seize the means of production, um, or the, the, this is becoming increasingly popular. The the idea, especially in Germany, that um, and in in other Western countries like like Britain as well. It started to catch on this this idea that that you can achieve achieve socialism through through capturing the state in in bourgeois elections and um, and you you introduce reforms and then from the reforms or from seizing seizing the means of production in a revolution then then you can. Uh, move on through socialism into into communism. Um, so there's these four stages, and um, and all the all the groups taking part in the in, in the second working men's international, more or less, whether they're reformist or whether they're revolutionary, have of all absorbed this basic idea, which they think originates in Marx. And that is highly debatable, but um, they, they, this is what they believe. And, um, and this influences the Russian Social Democratic uh, Party very strongly. And, and they um, take it on to other, other levels. We'll deal with that later on. But, but this is the, this is the, this is the Stuttgart, um, uh, conference of the International Working Men's Association, the second international. Okay, next slide. Right, so in the meantime, uh, in, in 1905, the, um, there is a revolution that takes place in, in Russia. This is uh, the Tsarist troops opening fire on the crowds in St. Petersburg. Uh, and it takes place at the end of the Russo-Japanese War, when the Russo-Japanese War is winding down. Um, the Russo-Japanese War is a, it's a calamity for the Russian Empire. They, they get in a, in a conflict with the new rising capitalist power of Japan, and, and they lose very badly and uh, suffer some huge defeats. Um, the, 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 the 
and the people seize the opportunity to to rise up against 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 the czar um, over economic issues as well as political ones. Next slide. Okay, so this is um, a rather anachronistic picture of a sort of Paris Commune style street barricade that, um, but it, 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 all it does is it illustrates that this is a serious, serious revolution um, where, where, they, where in, in large parts of the country, workers and peasants um, were rising up to, um, and demanding that, that the czar abdicate. Um, but they're also doing other things, and this is very important. What they are doing is that they are establishing Soviets, and Soviets are um, workers' councils, basically. They, they, um, they are, uh, and they're spontaneous. They, they, they don't arrive out of any, arise out of any great theory uh, or, um, or input from the so-called professional revolutionaries, it, it arrives directly out of, out of the working class and directly out of the peasantry who enact, enact, these, enact these and create this, this, this form of Soviet, which is a, a, um, a Soviet with a small s as opposed to Soviet with a capital S. This is quite an important distinction to make as well. And, and the Soviets um, with, with the small s, as I say, are, are spontaneous and autonomous creations of, of the working class. Um, and these, these start to take over and they start to run things themselves. So they set up communes, both in factories and in the countryside. Okay, next picture. So, um, unfortunately, the, uh, the 1905 revolution is crushed in the end, uh, but, and uh, the, the black hundreds are brought out uh, by Stolipin and, and uh, people like him in the, in the czarist, uh, hierarchy and the and the black hundreds are a, a clerical driven organization um, everybody dresses in black and they and they um, and they're very very chauvinistic uh, Russian Russian nationalistic and um, orthodox um, Christian and they take it out of anybody who's especially if they're Jewish, there's a lot of pogroms that immediately follow the, the um, crushing of the, of the revolution because they believe that, um, that, that it's a Jewish conspiracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and this is, and this is, uh, um, and, and these people are, are, are quite sort of proto-fascist, in, in, in many, in many um, sense. So, so they are, they are, um, they are used to, to crush all, all dissent, even, even very minor, minor um, progressive dissent. Uh, and they also have this um, uh, anti-Semitic uh, streak to them as well. Okay, next slide. So if we, we're going, we've now moved on a bit and um, in the meantime, we've had the triple, the triple entente has been formed, which is uh, Russia, uh, France and, and Britain uh, to contain in their eyes, to contain the rising power of Germany. Germany allies with Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. And, uh, and then there's a kickoff that happens between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. Germany's drawn in with its alliances 
and um, and the uh, and the triple entente um, are, are are brought in. Uh, it, it, Russia Russia is is supporting Serbia, and the um, and the and the Germans have a defence plan where they invade Belgium. Um, and 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 the Britain has an alliance with Belgium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the, France, of course, is being attacked as well. So, so the um, so the the whole in, uh, struggle between the imperialist powers has kicked off in Europe, and uh, the and the Tsarist regime has joined the fray. It didn't have to join the fray, but it does. And um, here its soldiers are showing suitable humility and um, kneeling before the Tsar who's presenting an icon to them. But um, it should be pointed out that when the Russian army um, initially, it's, it's learned a lot of lessons from 1905 in terms of its training and in, in terms of, um, of the motivation of its soldiers, they are, they're all volunteers initially, um, but the leadership and logistics is, is abysmal and within a short time, all the early Russian advantages have been squandered. And next slide in blood and death. So this, that's a picture of blood and death. And the, um, these are Russian soldiers who been massacred uh, in a wood. And uh, we know that they're Russian because they don't have any, any gas masks. That's what the source uh, points out. Uh, we don't know quite how they've been killed, whether they actually have been massacred. Um, after surrendering, or whether they have been um, uh, killed in a, in artillery bombardments or machine gunned or whatever, we we're not entirely sure. But um, but I mean, this is this is typical of what is happening on the Eastern Front. The um, the Russian army, it, um, I say, after its initial initial um, strength has been has been squandered it's now con it's conscripts again and and the conscripts um, are getting are getting massacred on mass the Russian army never it never gives its soldiers gas masks throughout the throughout the war despite the fact that um, from 1915 onwards the Germans are using gas on a regular basis. Okay, next slide. Right, so this is the, the front that appears in, uh, this is roughly, this front stayed fairly static from about 1916 to 17. Um, and you can see, you can see that there's a bit of, of to and froing there at the bottom where the dotted line is there's the Brusilov offensive, which is in 1916. Uh, that's followed by the Kerensky offensive in 1917. Um, after, after, the, after, the, after the February re 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 revolution, but it, it, it gives you, it gives you an, an idea of how, how far the Axis powers were able to advance. The, the Germans advance much further than the Austrians are able to advance. The Austrians keep on getting pushed back, but um, but the the but but the Russian army in particular. I mean, by this time, by 1916-17, the uh, soldiers on all all fronts are are fairly fed up. Um, that's in, in in all the nations. So so. The, the uh, it's particularly the, the weak, so it's 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 becoming a a a game of working out which which what which card is going to go down first. Um, the the Turkish army is very weak. The Austro-Hungarian army is very weak, and the um, 
and the Russian army is probably the weakest of the lot. So troops are deserting en masse from the front. You can see them on the right here. That the, the two figures on the on the on the left are are deserting and um, are, and, and trying to get home by the by the road. The road has got a a, um, a guard on it to 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 block it. So this guy is about to put his. Um, his rifle butt in their faces if they try to get by. Uh, the, 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 the one in the center there, he doesn't seem to have got the message yet. But the other one, uh, well, he's pretty much obviously decided, um, okay, the road is blocked here, but there's, there's a big field uh, over there that I can, I can just get home that way. It may be the long, long way home, but I can still get, get home. And um, so, so the the army is starting to disintegrate in in great numbers by by the the late late nineteen sixteen, and these and these soldiers, it has to be said, are, are going home. Most of them are peasants, and they're going home to their to their to the villages and um, once they get to the villages sometimes they take their weapons with them and they and then they um uh the the the, the peasants are are still fighting against privatizations of land so they just want to re-establish the the village 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 commune and of course now they're armed um thanks to the the uh, deserting soldiers returning home, that's exactly what they can do. Next slide. Okay, so we have here, this is the, uh, I'm afraid I can't read Russian, but that, I think that's that's the peace, bread and land um, slogan there on the, on the banner. Now, peace, bread and land is a, is a slogan which uh, emerges uh, by carried by demonstrators in Petrograd. Petrograd is the new name for St. Petersburg. It's been changed because they thought St. Petersburg sounded too German. And they, so they change it to Petrograd, which is more Russianized version of the name. And, um, and, the, and it, it was a spontaneous uprising uh, led by women, and uh, the demand that they that they uh, that they asked for was for peace, bread, and land, and um, it received great popular acclaim. You can see the crowds here um, around the women, and the um, and the. Uh, and the government responded in the same way as they did in, in 1905, and um, it, it didn't work this time. The, the soldiers uh, were not ready to shoot down people in the streets anymore. And, the, um, and although the, there was some violence to begin with, the, the, uh, the czar is eventually forced to abdicate and a provisional government uh, is set up. The provisional government, however, does not have very much power, as we shall see with the next picture. Next slide. Yeah, as in, as in 1905, the workers, peasants and soldiers, Soviets, which we've already been talking about, sprang up spontaneously in the cities and countryside alike. Um, from the moment the Tsar abdicates, well, actually it happened, it started before that, started almost as soon as the trouble in, in uh, as soon as the demonstrations started. And in, as far as the countryside's concerned, it was probably, uh, it was probably happening a lot earlier than that, as, as soon as the deserters got home. So, as I say, each Soviet, uh, with a small s, is a grassroots council for democratic decision-making, 
organized and enacted by the workforce in the workplaces. Um, and again, it has to be pointed out now, Lenin had, uh, Lenin was the leader of the Bolshevik section of the Social Democratic Party. Social Democratic Party had split um, in, in Russia, it had split between the Menshevik faction who wanted more, more slow um, reforms through the, through the state first, the Bolshevik section were, were more agitating for, for um, re revolutionary action. Uh, and, um, but the form of revolutionary action is, is, um, is by a, a cadre of, of committed and professional revolutionaries. Now this is very, very important because this this is, is what influences what happens later on. Um, and, um, but it has to be said here that, the, um, that these professional revolutionaries are caught napping. We have one of Lenin's letters. Uh, Lenin, Lenin wrote to, to a friend of his in, in late 1916, uh, and he says, um, we, we might as well give up here. The, the working class is never going to rise up. And um, uh, especially in, in Russia. So, so we might as well hang our boots up by the fire and um, enjoy the, the rest of our lives. And of course, a few, a few, just a few months later, he gets, he gets caught napping. Um, and he's not the only one. Um, even even people within the uh, socialist revolutionary party who are close to the peasants, some of them are caught napping as well. Um, but the, but the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks are are, um, are are astounded by by what happens spontaneously, the what the workers and peasants and soldiers are capable of doing themselves. So they have to play catch up with them. Um, and they do that by uh, Lenin in most, most um, famously, he starts to write the, uh, the State and the Revolution, which is one of his pamphlets. And, um, and, the, and the State and the Revolution is, is, a, is, is, is a, it's a, it is actually where he he becomes sort of anarchist in in a sense. What, what he's saying in, in in the state and the revolution is that we have to get rid of the state. Um, of course, he doesn't follow through with that, but um, but that's what he's he's saying in order to get get the support that 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 he needs because because this is where. The, the workers and the peasants are the, the the workers and the peasants don't see the need for the state they, they don't see the need for for a um for to go through the stages to go through capitalism etc they think we can just get straight to socialism or straight to communism we don't need we don't need to go through capitalism first um and lenin initially that's that's what he he agrees with. Okay, next slide. So this is the July days. Um, the the it has to be said the provisional government is very weak. Uh, it as I was saying the the workers Soviets have pretty much taken over the factories already, um, and the the um, and the and the peasants have, have taken over. Over the land, so the uh, the provisional government is basically just a political puppet, um, and it's just who it's going to be puppeted by. That that is is a question. Of course, there are reactionary forces who want to restore the Tsar and to re restore the power of the aristocracy. There's also the revolutionary forces, um, which as I say, with the Mensheviks, they they want slow slower change, and the um, 
but the Bolsheviks and a section of the socialist revolutionaries are moving towards revolution. This is the July days, which is which uh, precedes uh, the October October Revolution, and um, this is a crowd being fired on by soldiers who are loyal, still loyal to the provisional government. Um, but the provisional government really doesn't do anything you know it introduces a few reforms but the but the workers and peasants have already pretty much done this for themselves anyway so it's it's just a piece of paper being waved about they um they've already done it um uh, as as in fact will happen on, in, in october as well into a certain degree um but what they are um but the but the provisional government really has uh, the only its only function is to carry on with the war um, that's the only real decision uh, it makes of, of any of any consequence and that is of course fatal to its own survival next slide so the 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 uh, gathering far right and reactionary forces. This is uh, Kornilov, General Kornilov, who is the first of the white generals whom we shall be talking about shortly. Um, he tries a coup. He tries to launch a coup from from the Baltic states, um, where he assembles a group of officers who think like him. You can see them all around him. And he uh, also has some loyal soldiers uh, who are loyal to his, his idea of, the, of, of, uh, of creating a coup in, by taking over uh, Petrograd. Uh, he, he, um, so, so he is, is attending to, to try this. Next slide. But uh, the Kornilov coup is foiled. Uh, it's foiled by the quick thinking and action of the railway workers. And this is quite interesting because it was actually railway workers uh, who were a mixture of different parties. So you probably had, you would have had uh, Bolsheviks, you would have had Mensheviks, you would have had um, socialist revolutionary workers and non-aligned workers, anarchist workers probably as well, uh, all speaking different languages. So Latvians, um, Estonians and Russian speakers, and they were all combined together uh, autonomously. They weren't told to do this by Lenin or Trotsky or anybody else, uh, they, or, or Kerensky. They, they just went out and they did it. Um, and it was obvious, despite the, the, end, the rather uh, anticlimactic end of the corner of coup, they just basically couldn't couldn't get into 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 Petrograd. Um, the the it's obvious to everybody now that the provisional government is living on borrowed time. Either the left. It's going to have to take it out of commission, or the right will. So, it's it's um, it's it's days are are numbered as far as everybody in in Russia is is concerned. They can they can see the writing on the wall. Uh, so, Red October happens. So, uh, the that's the October Revolution. That's um, October nineteen seventeen. And um, it's later portrayed in Communist Party propaganda as being, um, as being a, a great big event with um, lots of guns going off and people running about and so on and so forth. But actually it was very anti-dramatic, especially in Petrograd, not so much in Moscow, there was a bit of fighting and carrying on there, but in, in Petrograd, they basically just walk in. They they pretty much walked into the into the Winter Palace, this famous uh, icon of uh, of the movie maker 
Eisenstein. Um, they pretty much walked in, and nobody nobody was um, was was killed. Um, but it's it's um, it's it's the the October Revolution, however, requires the Bolsheviks to make some compromise. The Bolsheviks are a party which uh, have this very um, this this idea that they are the only the only people who have have the right idea, and everybody else has the wrong idea, and uh, they're, so they're very sectarian. And um, but in order to carry Oct the October Revolution out, they need to join up with other 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 revolutionary groups. So they so they do join up with the with the left of them of the, the, some left activists in the, in the Menshevik Party. Uh, in particular, the most famous of them is is Leon Trotsky himself, because. Um, Leon Trotsky remained a Menshevik right up until quite late on, and it was only when he was offered uh, power by by Lenin that he changes he, he changes tune and he becomes a Bolshevik. Um, similarly, the social socialist revolutionaries join in, or the left wing of the socialist revolutionaries join in, in particular. And also the anarchists. The anarchists are quite important because they um, are particularly strong in the crucial naval base at Kronstadt, which is just outside St. Petersburg, and, and they um, and they 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 form the elite uh, forces in the in the Red Guards immediately after the after the o October Revolution. Um, and they enable the takeover of, of, of Petrograd very quickly. Next slide. So the first fault lines in this revolutionary coalition were to form around the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Uh, now this was a treaty which the, which the Germans um, because the Lenin and, and company said um, that 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 they that they that, that they now wanted a treaty with um, with with Germany, they weren't going to continue with the war, uh, which was a wise decision. But the uh, but the but the means in which they did it is questionable. Um, Arguably, what they could have done was that, 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 that they could have uh, just um, ignored um, the, the, um, the, 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 the Germans. The, 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 you, you, you can see the, the front line there. I mean, this, this is the same front line as we saw in, in the other picture. Um, what, the, what the Germans and the Austrians demanded at the at the at, at the peace treaty of Brest Litovsk is that all that area of pink. So so that's way beyond what they've actually won by by the for, by force of arms. And uh, Lenin and Trotsky agree to this. Um, they obviously don't want to agree to it, but they but they do agree to it. Um, and uh, Maria Spiridonova of the left SRs, however, refuses to accept this approach. She's saying, no, we are fighting class war now. And um, what is the point of going into treaties, um, you know, treaties with bourgeois powers, which are going to be swept away by the revolution? Uh, so, so, so she's she's against that, and um, you know she had had a good point that um, that the Axis were just playing a game of bluff in the in the in the in the negotiations and convincing the uh, Lenin and Trotsky and and his uh, and the and the and the Russian 
embassy that um, that uh, that that they were that they were in a weaker position than they actually actually were. She was advocating that if if the if the Germans wanted to advance, they were welcome to, um, and that but there would be a guerrilla war. Um, it uh, would would immediately start, and the Germans, of course. And the uh, and the Austro-Hungarians as, as well. They all they wanted to transfer their troops to to other fronts. The the Germans wanted to to get get the troops that they had on the eastern front, in particular, to to the western front. Um, and they couldn't and and they couldn't do that without a treaty. So in fact, uh, the you know they desperately wanted to get those troops over there before the Americans arrived. So, um, so the so if if they'd been forced if if they had had um, had to take these 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 provinces by force of arms, uh, then then it would have it would have uh, it would have the 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 the, 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 the German the um, the the German army would have actually had to put more troops on the Eastern Front instead of less troops, because you always need more, a lot more troops when you're fighting guerrilla war than the other side has. Um, so you, in, in order to win a guerrilla war, you need about 10 times as many, as many troops as the, as the other side has because of the nature of the warfare. So, so in fact, she had quite a, a good point. Um, but of Lenin, Trotsky, and the, they they believed what the what the Germans were telling them, and they decided uh, to to sign the sign the treaty, even though it was going to mean that the the vast areas of um, of the agricultural land was going to be uh, in in the West was going to be. Of the of the empire were, 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 was going to be occupied by German and Austrian forces, so this is the first fallout, and um, and the um, and then the from from this this point onwards it starts to deteriorate. There are there is a constituent assembly elections are held in um, this was something that was originally agreed under the under the provisional government but had never taken place uh, it takes place in the first few months of the um, of 1918 and and uh, the left SRs Come out very strongly in it. And that's because Russia is overwhelmingly still an agricultural country. Um, there's the the it, the industry is is very is, is very small. The working class is comparatively small in, in terms of the um, urban urban working class. But the peasants are um, they vote in a majority of of socialist revolutionaries, and um, and the and the Bolsheviks disband it almost almost immediately. They're all, obviously not happy that there aren't, aren't that many Bolsheviks in it. Um, they get help, however, from the anarchists. Um, the anarchists uh, uh, help to put down um, the or to disband the. The the constituent assembly for different reasons. The the, um, the Bolsheviks are doing it because they 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 want to centralize power, whereas the anarchists are doing it because they they want to abolish the state. So quite different motives there, but that they somehow come together at the same time. Okay, next slide. Right. This is um, this is the peasant um, congress of Soviets uh, in 1918. Now the the original uh, what 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 happens um, after after 19 is that all the uh, suddenly 
suddenly there's great freedom, there's great, great freedom, um, at least on, on paper, you see the, the Bolsheviks say, oh, oh, we're giving you the, the, you know, all parts of the Soviets, this has become a Bolshevik slogan, so, so we're going to give all parts of the Soviets, and, um, and, and uh, workers and peasants are going to, are going to have, have a, um, have complete control, but in fact, the workers and peasants had already had, uh, seized in many cases complete control before even October Revolution. So, so the you know Lenin and Trotsky and people putting this into writing is is just um, you know this all they're doing is they're, is they're putting it in, into writing. You know that it's it's already happened um, and. And um, but in terms of the how the how the power works, the the, the Bolsheviks are believe that they're giving giving power to to the, to the workers, whereas in fact the workers have already done it themselves. Um, and and the and the Bolsheviks start to take over throughout 1918. They start to take over the the Soviets. So this is uh, Maria Spiridonova again. She's with the with the peasant peasant uh, Congress of Soviets. You can just see from from these sort of pictures how that that this is the emphasis on trying to trying to push forward is is the mass the mass um, support that's that's going on here the mass mass involvement of people, which. Um, which we are, are not really, um, which a lot of the interpretations of, of history, we get pictures of great, great leaders and so on and so forth. We never see the masses of people. This is what I'm trying to, trying to show is, is how, how involved people were in, in trying to transform their lives. The, the powers behind the scenes, as I say, there is uh, there's the this um, the Lenin and the, and the Bolsheviks. They start to introduce measures um, of centralizing power. Uh, this is justified under the term war communism, and by war communism, that includes requisitions from from the peasantry. Uh, once again, as I say, the the Bolsheviks are led by by a in, by an urban intelligentsia. They really have no idea about about the peasantry, and it was really a big, huge, big tragedy because the um, if they if they just listened and if they had combined with the socialist revolutionaries, they they could have um, you know socialist revolutionaries had a very clear understanding of what 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 how the peasants lived and um and what they needed and so on and so forth whereas the lenin and the bolsheviks tended to see them as did the mensheviks in fact in most parts of the former russian empire um they they saw the pe peasants as um sort of petty, petty bourgeois um, they were thinking of of how how Marx saw them back in in the um, he was talking about the French peasantry in in the sort of late nineteenth century who were very different to to the Russian peasantry um, of the early twentieth century, uh, but but um, but they were just using very crude. Crudifications of 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 Marx and applying it as a universal principle instead of instead of uh, to the to the specifics of of what was actually going on. Um, so so war communism's first um, big casualties is is the um, is it starts to to repress. They they start to bring in a, a secret police force just like the Tsar had. So you have the checkers, and the checkers replace the um, 
the Okhrana, which is the Tsarist uh, secret police. And, um, and you also have um, uh, commissars are brought in and, and they start to re-employ uh, as, the, as the civil war escalates, which we'll be showing in a minute, the, um, as the civil war escalates, the, 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 the Bolsheviks start to re-employ. Um, initially, they, they say, they say for the, for the army, they say all um, you know, soldiers have the right to elect, elect their own officers. Um, this all changes um, when Trotsky takes command of the Red Army. He, he brings back a lot of Tsarist officers who've changed sides. And, uh, and, and they become the leaders of the, of the Red Army. Right, next picture. So this is, the, this is a very rough map here on the, on the left. The map shows um, the, the developments in the, in the Civil War. So you have white generals, um, you can see their various names, they're Krasnov and Denikin and Varangel and Miller and so on and so forth, and Kolchak. Um, but but they um, but they this 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 map we can't really capture what's really going on in in um, in the civil war. The civil war is is very fragmented, extremely fragmented, in fact. And uh, this picture, although it gives a rough idea of what's happening, it's very um, the actual reality is very different to that because you have so many different forces are fighting each other you have um you have whites you have the greens the greens are the uh, nationalist forces so that would be the the finns the poles the ukrainians and so on and so forth and there were there's also the the reds which are people who've who've accepted soviet authority or the um, uh, Bolshevik authority and um, and then and then you have um, blacks blacks are the anarchist forces we'll be talking about them just in a minute and um, and you have the and you have the blues and the blues are the interventionist forces the interventionist forces are basically backing up the whites um, all the other groups are all uh, fighting each other, basically. The, um, the, the, the whites and the reds are the main adversaries. Uh, the, 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 the blacks are, are fighting most, most people, um, including the reds. Um, so the, so this, is the, this is the McNavist flag. The flag actually says, is translated as death to all who would stand in the way of workers' freedom. Uh, next picture. Yes, so this is this is the the most the largest and the, and the most effective anarchist army. It's uh, it, it 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 arose in the eastern U Ukraine. It was known as the Maklovchina. And um, it is an insurgent revolutionary army under the leadership of Nestor Bakto Machno, um, who took over much of the region and they established an anarchist confederation of communes. Um, Machno was a guerrilla leader extraordinaire, um, and arguably his fierce and highly mobile army, they were mounted on horses and chanka carts, uh, chanka carts being peasant. Uh, peasant carts, uh, and that's what they mounted their infantry on. Um, and it was a decisive factor in assisting the Reds to achieve victory at Orel over the white army of General Denikin, um, who was a major threat to the 
to the revolution. He was probably the only only one of the white generals who came anywhere near um, uh, establishing his power in Moscow. Uh, the the um, and the Magnus forces were active in his rear. They were cutting his supply lines and they were attacking him from behind. So uh, this is often left out by the, by the red version of events um, that, that how, how important Magnus forces were. You know, Magnus forces, they, they originally started out fighting the Austro-Hungarian occupiers who had come into the Ukraine after the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Um, and then they fought Ukrainian nationalists who were is what the Austrians handed, handed power over to. Um, and two, two different brands of, of the Ukrainian nationalists, I have to add. Um, then they fought the whites, um, General Denikin's forces. Um, then they then then the Red Army arrived, and the Red Army uh, started to repress them, started to put down their communes. Um, so so Magno fought them as well, and then and then he had to change tune again because the an, a new white general had arrived, General Brangle, and um, and and he had to had to join with the Reds again to to defeat, defeat Wrangel, but, um, but once Wrangel was out of the way, um, Trotsky, who, who uh, had been biding his time, made, a, made the, the final move against, against Magnus forces and uh, executed huge numbers of them and, um, and crushed their their, their confederation of communes. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a good illustration as well of how, how uh, chaotic the whole civil war period is um, and how often people changed sides and, and were fighting each other. Um, I mean, this was, this was not unique. Uh, this was happening all over, all over the country. Okay, next slide. So, and this is again, just, just a, a last bit about the Magnovich. You know, it it uh, illustrates that this, this picture, I think illustrates quite clearly that, they, that it was a mass movement. It, it wasn't just a bunch of uh, guys on horseback riding around um, under a charismatic leader. It was it was um, it was a mass movement, just like all the other things are um, in the in the Russian Revolution. You can see uh, you can see masses of of Ukrainian peasants there who are are taking part in in turning uh, their their lands back into back into 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 communes um, uh, supported by the. The uh, armed, armed, armed forces of the, of the, of the Mag Magnovchina. Okay, next picture. Right, the Bolshevik Party too. We have to, we have to point out the Bolshevik Party. Although I've been emphasising the its, uh, its authoritarian sides, um, it also had democratic sides. Um, and this is this is quite important to, to bring out. Uh, the Bolshevik Party provides considerable space for internal democracy right up until 1922. They put a stop to it in 1922. Um, but both both Lenin and Trotsky in the in the previous periods they they had to they had to struggle because um, in order to to, to to enforce their will. Um, I mean, they wanted highly centralized authoritarianism, uh, and they wanted the, to to be able to for the party to control the Soviets um, and not the other way around, and um, and they ran into big opposition. And they ran into uh, there were various different factions. There were both right and left factions within the Bolsheviks. 
um, and um, and the the and this this uh, these these pictures here show show the the um, what was known as the workers' opposition group. Um, the workers' opposition group were the most left group, um, and they were led by Alexandra Kolontai, who you can see on the left there. And there's a group of people up at the top um, who who um, who were um, other members of the of the group, and. As I say, they were they were very oppositional to to Lenin and Trotsky and their drift towards authoritarian structures. Um, but in the end, they they did not they failed to stand up to the to to Lenin and Trotsky when they when they um, decided to crush the Kronstadt routing, which we'll be dealing with in a second. Um, and um, because of that, they became politically ir ir irrelevant because that was their moment when they should have acted and and should have should have uh, said no more. Um, but they didn't, and um, the rest is history, as they say. So Alexander Kolontai actually survives. She ends up um, being after after she's been humiliated late, much later on. Um, she she ends up being the Soviet uh, ambassador to Sweden, and that's how she ends her life. Um, that's in in the in the Stalin era. She's quite lucky. She's very lucky, in fact, because all the guys you can see in the picture above. They all get um, once you can assume Stalin already had their names down as troublemakers, and and uh, in the thirties, all these guys are are um, are executed. Next slide. Right um, across. Across the world, the the peace has broken out. The um, there's there's been an armistice signed. Now this is quite important as well. Actually, we should talk about the armistice. Um, right, the Germans, um, despite the fact that they transfer troops across, um, Germany is really not wanting to. The, the mass of the German people are not wanting to continue the war at all. Um, the Germans launch a brief offensive in the spring of 1918 on the Western Front to try and win the war before the Americans come in. They fail. Um, and um, in the aftermath, revolution starts to break out in Germany. And this is this is this is the moment where things in history could have gone completely different if. If if things had gone another way, because the um, because one one never is forced to question why there was no armistice because the the objectives of Britain and France politically their objectives were to dismantle Germany. Britain didn't want a an, a, a um, capitalist rival, and and um, they perceived. Germany is their main capitalist rival. They wanted to break up, uh, up Germany back into small states, um, make sure that it would never be united power again. Um, France similarly wanted to, to do that because they were afraid that, that Germany was going to conquer, conquer them militarily. Um, and, and, and that that's what the French and British politicians wanted. However, the, the generals um, on the ground, uh, they, they were reluctant um, and they pushed for, for an armistice um, because, they, because on paper they could defeat the German 
uh, you know, the German army had basically disintegrated. So um, in much the same way as the Russian army had. And uh, so, so therefore they, they had a wide open field to just march in and do what they wanted to do. But they decided to go for the armistice. The armistice was to give the German ruling class a time to recover. And, um, and they, um, uh, and they, so they, they actually stop advancing. And in addition to that, you see the, there were a lot of disgruntled French soldiers. French soldiers have been mutinying uh, in, in the previous year. The British army had um, pretty much collapsed in the spring of 1918. Um, even though that that is hushed up, the the, 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 the it is it is it is it is it is true that the British army uh, pretty much collapsed in that in the in the in the spring 1918 offensive, um, and the the um, and there was what was um, and in the rear of the German army at this point were a so-called German front line. Uh, they were, there were, there was absolute chaos. The, it, as far as the German generals were, were concerned, they, they had no control over, over events anymore. The, there were soldiers and sailors and workers it, all joining together, um, roaming around like you see in this, in this picture. And, um, and not only German, um, Germans, uh, in Belgium, for instance, we, we know through uh, documents that have been unearthed, we know that, that, um, that, the, that the German, that the mutinous German soldiers there, they actually joined with Belgian workers and they and they set free French prisoners of war, um, and and they all joined in together to to create um, a revolutionary situation. So imagine if the disgruntled British and French soldiers had advanced into that, um, then what might have happened? The um, it might have gone that that the that the that the um, advancing allied troops might have um, well joined with the Germans um, and the, 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 um, the, the uh, uh, German mutineers. Um, it, is, it is perfectly, perfectly possible that this, this could have happened. Um, but the um, decision is made and the um, and this, this period of crisis, that just the end of 1918 um, is, is past um, and, and, the, and the capitalist powers uh, stay in the bowl for that one, just about. Okay, next picture. Yeah, so the German revolution of 1918 to 20, it happened in another problem with the German revolution is it happens not at once, it happens over several, several dates. So there's, there's the general collapse of, of the German armed forces from about September to uh, November, 1918. Um, that's, that's the first revolutionary wave. Um, and then there's the, the uh, Spartacus rising in 1919. Uh, there's also Munich rising in, in 1919, music, Munich Soviet set up. Um, and then in 1920, there's, there's a, a big revolution in the Ruhr Valley, um, but it's pretty much all subsided at the end of 1920. Um, but once again, you have, uh, in, in all of these events, you have workers and soldiers taking to the streets en masse and setting up Soviets. Um, now, at the end of the, of the First World War, with the armistice, you see the, the rulers of Germany are able to hand over power to somebody else. Um, they obviously want, they have to get rid of the Kaiser, 
and nobody wants the Kaiser anymore. So he's kicked out. And, um, and in order to save themselves, they hand power to who were who supposed to be their enemies, the Social Democratic Party. Uh, now, the Social Democratic Party had, a, as we were talking about, the Social Democratic Party has um, unfortunately got, got uh, the, their principal elements who've opposed, opposed the First World War. But, but in, in terms of the actual politicians, a lot of them have, have um, obviously known which side of their bread was, was buttered. And they decide, and they decided to take take the side of um, German nationalism, uh, and it, it, this is back in 1914. And and it's this this um, this section of the of the Social Democratic Party that uh, get handed power um, directly from the from the from the ruling ruling class of Germany. Um, and, the, and these social democrats are equally alarmed by the course of events. They don't want a revolution either uh, because that'll undermine their, their own power. So the first action upon taking government from the Kaiser, generals and Junkers is to establish, um, is, is to enable rather a proto-Nazi paramilitary Freikorps which uh, you can see in the picture above, um, who go out to crush the revolution using shocking brutality. I think you can see one, some guy's got flamethrower there. Um, and um, one of their most in infamous acts, which everybody's probably heard about, but, um, but it is certainly not their most atrocious. They, they committed lots of atrocities against uh, masses of workers. Uh, the the actions were these. The, the, the most famous actions were the arrest, torture, and summary execution of two leading SDP politicians, who had who were principled enough to actually oppose the war, both of them, and also just uh, they chosen to support the revolution. These were Karl Liebknecht and uh, Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, so, I mean, the, 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 this is where the, the Working Men's International uh, from the, the second Working Men's International really falls apart. It's already fallen apart in 1914, uh, but it, it's completely destroyed at this point because the um, Social Democratic Party leaders are showing no solidarity whatsoever with the working class and in fact are enabling the people who would eventually rise into the Nazi party, the Freikorps, to, um, to do their dirty work for them. Next slide. So in, in, in Hungary, there's a short lived Soviet Republic. We won't go into that in great detail. But it's um, led by Bela Kun. It only survives for a few months. Um, initiative here is lost. It's it's it is a revolutionary movement, um, and it is originally has great popularity, but it it collapses through a mix of centralized top down decisions and scandal, um, and it alienates er the early mass support it had. And then it's 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 crushed by counter-revolutionary forces, um, and once again, um, as so often happened in the in the period, the counter-revolution is followed by by pogroms, particularly against Jewish people. Um, across across the former Russian Empire as well, uh, many former subject nations seize the opportunity for self-determination. Um, these, these are very, very um, fragmented and very uh, confusing uh, actions going on 
the um, and the they're both right and left wing elements within the nationalist forces. Uh, this is important to to emphasize. Uh, for instance, the there's there's Mensheviks who take over in Georgia um, and actually bring about a um, sort of New Deal type solution, like uh, 30 years before it it, um, it it was to emerge in in Europe, um, and and in the Americas, um, but but. Um, uh, and, and they and they get their power from the fact that they have actually listened to the peasantry. The the only social democratic, uh, only only group of the social democratic party who actually bother to organise amongst the peasantry and to actually listen to them. Um, and um, but but they are eventually uh, crushed by the Red Army. Um, and there's also Latvia. Latvia is quite interesting because Latvia has the in the con um, constituent assembly elections, the, well, the Bolsheviks in, in Latvia get a huge majority. Um, and then there's interventions from the whites. There's the Germ German uh, forces get involved. There's the Freikorps. The Freikorps, which we've already been talking about, Freikorps arrive in Latvia um, and create havoc. And um, there's, as I say, there's also white forces, then the red forces, um, then there's nationalist forces, uh, and then there's um, the red army uh, comes back in, but but this time they're they're not they're not they've lost their popularity and they um, are eventually kicked out by the nationalists. So, so it's a really complicated interplay. The confusion of the civil war is just unbelievable. Okay, next picture. Right, this is Italy. So you have the two red years in 1919 to 20. It shows a factory occupation um, in Italy, the Biennio Rosso, and um, Italian ex-soldiers again join forces with the with the workers. They set up Soviets and factory occupations in this period. Paradoxically, it's the Italian Socialist Party who who um, who actually supports these actions. Um, the Communist Party. Uh, is looking to Moscow for, for guidance, whether they should support it or not. And, and the Communist Party, which is now developed from, from the Bolshevik Party, um, they, they refuse to, to back the, um, the, the occupations, which is quite ironic. Um, but, you know, it, it's all to do with centralization of authority. Okay, next slide. So in France as well, there's revolution uh, hanging around in the air. There's the French Black Sea fleet, mutinies, and uh, refuses to take part in any more uh, support of the, of the whites. Um, and this scene on, on the left, again, again, it's just to show what a mass um, the, um, mass movement this revolutionary period was. This is in the middle of Paris and it's just after there's been an inquiry cover up into the assassination of the socialist Jean Jaurès. He, he was assassinated because he was trying to, to get the international working, uh, workers to to uh, resist the war in 1914, and and this is this is this is the crowds in Paris who are objecting to the to the cover up over his assassination. Next slide. In Britain as well, there's there's trouble. Uh, the, this picture shows an attack by. Um, 
police against some striker who is um, remonstrating. Uh, this is steel workers strike 1919 um, and he's getting a baton in, in face in his face for the for the effort. Um, there's also a mutiny in the fleet in the British fleet as well. They um, they uh, are object objecting to to um, to the intentions of the military, which is to send them into Russia um, and to to make sure that they're repressing revolutions all around the world. Uh, and the and the fleet just want to go home. Uh, they they there is there's also um, it's also to do with pay as well. Um, and, but they run up the 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 red red flag. Um, there's also there's also serious trouble in Glasgow. Um, there's what's known as Red Clydeside, uh, which is roughly from about 1918 to 1920. Um, and most significantly, elements of the in the War of Independence of Ireland has also taken on a socialist character, and Soviets are briefly established there too. Next slide. So in the in the USA again, there's there's a wave of general strikes in 1919. Most significantly, the cities of Seattle and Winnipeg. Uh, workers refused to handle supplies going to U.S. occupation forces in Russia. Uh, the and in 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 addition, we know that there are many other events that took place in uh, many other other uprisings in Spain, in Argentina, in, in Mexico, in um, Egypt and, and China. Um, the records about this, this are limited, um, but they haven't been recorded to the same degree because anarcho-syndicalists and other so associated social movements were, were mainly involved rather than the, um, than any Mos Moscow dominated Communist Party. Next slide. Right, so the common turn is set up. Now, the Bolshevik Party has renamed itself. Actually, it's renamed itself in 1918, but, um, but the name change doesn't really sink in until at least 1919, um, that they are now the Communist Party of the, of the Soviet Union. A capital S, um, as opposed to the small s. Um, and um, the early early conferences of the Third International are held from 1919 to 22 period, um, and it's supposed to be a replacement for the Second International, which had fallen apart through lack of solidarity and opportunism by by um, members of the of the Social Democratic parties. Who had uh, failed to to show workers solidarity and had joined up with the nationalist forces. Um, the, so the first first event of these in 1919 is actually attended by a wide variety of socialist groups, and some of them are very critical of Soviet policies. Um, you know, they 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 did show up, and they and they are. Um, in general support of the revolution, but they are critical of some of the policies. You would have thought Lenin would have either brushed that off or he would have, um, or he would have, uh, um, you know, taken on board, you know, what, what people were saying. You know, maybe, maybe some things did need to be alterated, but instead um, he, his intentions are made clear by 1922. He's only going to tolerate socialists to take their cue from the increasingly centralized and dogmatic policies of the Politburo in Moscow. So um, he introduces a set of 21 conditions, which everybody has to sign. So either you get this um, form before you even, even invited to arrive, you've got to fill in the form. And it's there's 21 conditions you've got to sign up to. If you do, if you fail to sign up to uh, even one of those boxes, you're you're not allowed to attend. 
So not surprisingly, attendance drops off quite considerably as the years go on. Um, we'll have the next picture. Right, so you know, there's a bit of trouble on the way. Um, internal trouble this time. Um, this is this is the this is the start of the Kronstadt rising. Um, the workers and um, soldiers on the island of Kronstadt, which I've mentioned earlier, uh, quite quite a lot of anarchists involved, but also Bolsheviks, and um, and they and they they decide that they they've had enough of what's known as war communism um this is the uh, the extreme centralization of power with cheka secret secret police not being able to to publish your own your own um uh, non authorized by the bolshevik party um uh, uh, bulletins or um or or proclamations you're not allowed to do that um and the commissars telling everybody what to do in the in the factories and in the in the army and so on and so forth and the and the reimposition of those czarist officers um and and um, so, so this is this shows shows the the uh, the, the the start of the Kronstadt, Kronstadt rising, which takes place in the in the middle of of um, this. It takes place in March 1921, um, in the middle of the um, national conference of the of the of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Next picture. So, so this is possibly the most serious threat to the Communist Party leadership. As I say, if the workers opposition had acted at this point, they did object to, to what was going on, but they didn't act. And, um, and if they had acted, then um, it could have stopped what was about to happen. But the but the Kronstadt sailors mutiny at the end of nineteen um, sorry at the start of nineteen twenty one um, their demands are for the um, return to all power to the Soviets which is what the, which is a slogan which the Communist Party had taken taken power on so why couldn't they uh, revert to it because the civil war was pretty much over. Um, and uh, so why couldn't they go back to that? Um, and they also wanted an end to land requisitions. Um, the, the peasants were, um, the, see the, 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 the Communist Party people, uh, as I say, they, they were urban intelligentsia um, so, and they had no idea what the peasants were capable of or, or what they weren't capable of or what their real motivations were. So the land requisitions that the very, very brutal land um, uh, land requisitions were, were, were brought in during the war communist period to, to, to make sure that there was enough food for the city. So so the so there were requisition squads that used to go out from the cities, um, Communist Party people, out to the to the countryside, and they would shoot a few peasants, and then they would say, uh, "If you don't give up your your grain, we're going to shoot shoot some more of you." Um, th these were actual orders laid down by Lenin. Um, and um, it's not really a way of winning friends and influencing people. Um, and in fact, it was all based on incorrect data. Uh, what, what they were using, they, they were using the, 
these these surpluses, uh, which they had um, the the documentation about the about surpluses from the old Tsarist period. So if say uh, let's say a, um, a village is supposed to produce, produce under the under optimal conditions, it's supposed to produce um, so many bushels of wheat or whatever, um, and then suddenly this drops down quite considerably. The the immediate reaction of the of 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 the communist party is not is not a a practical one. It's an ideological one, and they they, they say. Well, they must be hold, they, they must have this grain, and they're holding it back because they are petty bourgeois. They're cap, they're they're wannabe capitalists. They're trying to sell it in the open market, and so on and so forth. Whereas, in actual fact, in the vast majority of cases, they um, that was not not the case at all. That they that they were it was literally the the war and the and the civil war. Um, had, had, and 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 the revolution had meant that that the that the that the um, that the production level um, of of grain had had fallen off, um, and so if the if the requisition squads went in and, and took it, um, it meant that it, it didn't mean that the peasants were hoarding it, it um, for to sell, it meant they, they were hoarding it because um, they wouldn't survive the winter otherwise. And, um, and of course, there was great starvation. Um, and a lot of it is boils down to these, to these requisition squads. Um, so, so they want, so the so the demands of the Kronstadt um, uh, rebellion was to was to, as I say, give all part of the Soviets end to end to requisition um, of uh, of the peasantry, and put a stop to the war communism repressions of the commissars and checkers. Um, and nearly three quarters of the rebels were committed workers and peasants who had already borne the brunt of the revolutionary and civil war fighting. So Trotsky and Lenin should really have been listening to these people, but they weren't. Um, and in fact, all they did was to prepare the ground for their suppression with overt lies and slanders spread through communist party control over the press. Uh, Next slide. So here, um, here we have loyalist troops uh, finally attacking across the ice uh, and um, suppressing the, the Kronstadt rising. Uh, it was suppressed with extraordinary ruthlessness and brutality. Um, and this was arguably even more ruthlessness and brutality than they had been forced to use against the whites. So what is actually going on here? We will be discussing that more in the next episode where we'll be moving on to the, to the, um, to the aftermath, the new economic policy, which is introduced. Um, and um, uh, the, just as a final point, I'll just point out that that, um, that when Red Army units were originally switched to to um, to try and cross the the rising, a lot uh, um, on the on the island, uh, a lot of them defected. Um, so they had to bring in. In order to crush the rising, they had to, to arm the Cheka people, the, the political police. They had to arm them. They had to arm delegates who had come in for the Communist Party conference um, and give them arms and uniforms and machine guns and so on. 
Um, and the, the, the irony again is that the uprising was put down by former Tsarist officers. Um, these were, well, the most famous one is Tukhachevsky. Um, and then there was another one called, believe it or not, um, ironically, Raskolnikov. If anybody's read any Dostoevsky, they'll understand. Um, okay, so in the in the next part, we will be doing dealing with the e e economy, society, and um, that that emerges out of out of the out of the remains of the Russian Revolution. As I say, this this is is quite a good point to end. End, end it just when we're going into the new economic policy. Okay, thank you very much.